Hey, mouth, blow, scatter, edge. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn me, turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from the oppression of men, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Your law is not obeyed. Okay, what do we got here? Um, all right. Look at somebody's actually here on time today. I won't say who, but I'm rather astonished at this wonderful news. Um, okay, this is for, and that's for, okay, I wasn't prepared. I, I was a little not prepared today, so here, um, okay, got this, got this, and Jesus Film. All I'm going to do is read you the stats for the Jesus Film, because uh, on Sunday I'll read more of it, but uh, they had 55 people in total that came to this Jesus Film meeting a couple wow. days ago. Ten people came to believe him as their savior. Mm. So he's just doing wonderful things. He gave a complete report on all the uh, different things he did, uh, Bible distribution, uh, food for poor families, children's meeting, Bible studies, prayer requests. And he, if anybody wants it, he attached uh, pictures as well. So uh, you can send me an email, and I'll send you a copy of that. And um, so we got that good news. And let's see here. Loretta is not here. She's... Uh, uh, her son's family, uh, she believes they have COVID. They've got something. And so, uh, and then she was with them. So she's praying that she doesn't get it as well. But uh, keep Loretta in prayer just so that if she does get sick, it won't be a bad one. And uh, okay, uh, that's all of that. We'll take this out here and we put this over here. And then we need to, a little disorganized. I, we were talking and I didn't realize how late it was. So we started a little late today. Let's see here. Um, today is the 13th. Yes, 13th. Luther's wedding night. Ooh. Uh, Catherine von Bora found herself virtually imprisoned as a nun at Cistercian Convent of Nimschem, Germany in the 16th century. Relatives were unable to speak to her through a latticed window, and she was even forbidden to talk to her fellow nuns. Oh, boy. Silence was the rule at Cistercian Convent. Catherine managed to smuggle in reading material, the writings of a man named Martin Luther, and she began hoping for new life. In 1523, she and several other nuns hatched an escape plan. Imagine this! No! It's just unbelievable! Nuns on the run. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Nuns on the run, okay. Uh, and they sneaked word to Luther. He recruited a merchant who sold smoked, smoked herring. The man, I can't see because I got tears in my eyes. Uh, the, the uh, man made a delivery to the convent, and when he left, the nuns were stowed away in the empty herring barrels. <sighs> Luther succeeded in finding husbands for all the women except Catherine, a strong-willed twenty. Oh, I see, they spelled the word wrong. A uh, 26-year-old redhead. At length, he proposed to her. The account of their wedding night by Luther's biographer, Richard Friedenthal, leaves us, well, curious. On the evening of 13 June 1525, according to the custom of the day, Luther appeared with his bride before a number of his friends as witnesses. The Pomeranian Johann Bergenhagen blessed the couple who consummated the marriage in front of the witnesses. Just Wait as, a second. <laughs> I, yes, this is what it says. No, 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 no. Just as Jonas doing? reported the next day, Luther has taken Katharina von Bora to wife. I was present yesterday and saw the couple on their marriage bed. I watched the spectacle. I could not hold back my tears. The marriage created a storm of criticism in church circles across Europe. I would think so. Yeah. Erasmus called it a comedy, and Henry VIII called it a crime, as if he should talk. But Luther said, I would not change my 
Katie for France and Venice because God has given her to me. She proved equal to her role as Protestantism's first pastor's wife, becoming known as First Lady of the Reformation. Um, Proverbs 31, her words are sensible and her advice is thoughtful. Her husband says there are many good women, but you are the best. Okay, that was the most bizarre that commentary I've bizarre. ever, ever read in my life. Ah, oh, I, I can't even imagine. I That's just like, that's the most bizarre thing I have ever, ever read in my life, bar none. And then the nuns on none? the run thing bar is none? just great. <laughs> Are we continuing on that this? That was just great. Okay, so we have... Um, we're in uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Okay, so you might as well read that. Start with uh, whatever, 14, so you can get the backup. And then we're in the middle of 316 right now. That's where we're at. Oh, that's right. We didn't finish that. No, we didn't. I, I thought we would go to the next chapter, but I guess not. So let me just start with uh, 14. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that, 15, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is in which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. 16. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed in on in the world, was taken up in glory. Okay, so this one says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Okay, so uh, we're in the middle of verse 316. The words here are set in contrast to the previous words, which was seen by angels from the highest of the heavenly host to the lowly Gentile. The mystery of godliness is revealed through the person and work of Christ. God had set Israel apart from the nations and thus the work of Messiah was believed to only pertain to them, or so they thought. You know, as I've said many times, if you just go back to the book of Isaiah and read it, especially you get to 45, it, it, there's no doubt that God was doing something for the whole world. He said, uh, it's too light of a thing for me to uh, bring salvation to my people. I will make him as a light to the Gentiles. It's right there. Anyway, but they uh, they did think that they were the only ones that would receive this salvation at the time, and they were totally, totally opposed to Paul's ministry. And Paul is a Jew. He was called by Jesus, and he was told to go. Go do this thing. And so he did. I mean, he's not going to be disobedient to the Lord. And the Gentiles, all the way through the book of Acts, did every single thing possible to get rid of him. They tried to kill him. They tried plots against him. They tried to have him imprisoned, and on and on and on. It never ended with Paul, and yet he persisted in doing what he was supposed to do. He was fulfilling the words of the Lord from the Old Testament that they did not want him to uh, uh, participate in. So, the mystery of godliness is revealed through the person and work of Christ, even to the lowly Gentile. God had set Israel apart from the nations, and thus the work of the Messiah was believed to only pertain to them, or so they thought, but God had shown in advance that this was not so. Now, I said Isaiah 45, but I'm going to read you Isaiah 49, because I think that's what it is. Um, that's what it says here, and I just gave the wrong chapter, but Isaiah 49, verse 6 says, Yes, I gave you the wrong chapter earlier. It's 45, not 49. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my, he's speaking of the coming Messiah, okay? That you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And there's a little pun in there because my salvation would be what? the name Jesus, Yeshua. And so he's making a pun, you will be my salvation to the end. So it's like when Jesus was at Zacchaeus' house, what did he say to him? Surely salvation has come to this house. And he was saying, surely I have come to this house because he is salvation. He is Yeshua. 
So uh, you'll see these puns throughout Scripture. You know, the Lord, the Lord, strong and mighty, he has become our salvation. He has become our Jesus, okay? So, um, uh, so he thought, but God had shown in advance that this was not so. In Isaiah 49, 6, which I just read, he shows that the coming of Christ would be for all. And not only would the Christ be a light for salvation to the Gentiles, but the word through Isaiah shows that they would stream to that light. As it says, and so while the Gentiles are streaming to that light, Israel was rejecting it. And that was all part of God's plan. I mean, we've seen that in the uh, sermons from uh, Jephthah and other sermons as well. But it says there in Isaiah 11, verse 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Okay, so there's a lot in Isaiah 11 that's uh, very, very interesting. It, it speaks of the seven spirits of the Lord there. And uh, somewhere in, let me see if I can find it very quickly. Uh, yes, verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. He said that before they were exiled one time. They were exiled a second time. So even in Isaiah, it prophesied that they would be two exiles. None of this should be a surprise to anybody if they picked up their Bible and read it. But they didn't. And they trusted the people, the leaders of Israel, to be their spiritual mentors. And it cost them in the end. And that's the same thing that happens in the church all the time. We trust a pastor to do what we were just talking about. The Southern Baptist Convention did the right thing. They voted at their meeting no female pastors, but it was 61%. It should be 99.9% .9 and the one vote would be the one woman on the voting team who shouldn't be there, right? I mean, the whole thing is just bad, but people, they trust people instead of reading the word of God. And if you're not going to read the word of God, and if you're not going to know it, you're going to go into an exile. And then you're going to go into a second exile. And you're going to go through the punishments of Deuteronomy. Or your church is going to have its lampstand removed. Or whatever. It's all given in advance. It's not like any of this is a surprise to us if we pick up the word. But what was a surprise to us, and I will say this again Sunday, but I'm so excited about it that uh, I, I think I'll bring it up, is that we had rain. We had rain. So some things can be a surprise. Last Sunday, it was very dry for the past year and a half. It's been extremely dry. We got a little rain during the winter, but not nearly enough to fill up the aquifers. And so on Sunday, we prayed for rain. And what did it say on the forecast? Like 40% this day, 20% this day. I mean, they gave us a percent chance of rain. We have gotten so much rain so often over the past three days and south of us those people have gotten literally three and four feet of rain they're just completely inundated so when the lord when you pray to the lord and you ask you shouldn't be surprised but i was surprised i mean and hitiko knows the as soon as it started raining i i actually uh recorded it and i sent it off to you and i sent it to sergio the first thing I did, I ran over to the door, I opened it up, and I thanked the Lord, and I closed the door because it was pouring in. So, you know, it's just wonderful. And then we got in the house, it rained so bad that it went through the roof, and we got a bad roof now, so I've got to have that uh, looked at next Thursday, and we'll get it replaced in the next month or so, which is terrible, but it's bound to happen eventually. But um, uh, we, um, we had to put buckets all over and so we've got these metal buckets, and they're going ding, 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 before they finally filled up where they weren't tinging anymore, right? And so what did Sergio do? I sent him a, a, a copy of the audio of my house. Ding, ding, ding. He made a song out of it. He took it and put it on AI, and we got this song about rain coming through Charlie's roof. So anyway. Um, uh, well, I didn't have any. Pickle, I did have pickle buckets in the back of the truck, but I was not running out to the car. So I had the metal buckets in the garage that we use for mangoes. I just brought them in, and they were just big buckets all over the place. And we had towels all over, and the garage was flooded. And thank you for the rain, Lord. I'm so exciting, so exciting to have all that rain. Your what? mother was here, then she left. Did Who? Your mother? Oh, she probably forgot her, her uh, hearing aids. She does that all the time. So um, uh, despite being in their own writings, Isaiah 49.6, Isaiah 10.11, 11.10, there's my dyslexia going off again. 
Despite being in their own writings, none could have guessed what lay ahead. Certainly, even the heavenly host missed it, as Israel did. But Paul was called to reveal what had been hidden. N U N. Yes, yes. None. Another one. None could back to that get again. it. So yes, um, reveal what had been hidden. The irony of Paul's selection for this wonder is almost palpable. He was the epitome of Jewish Jewish life and culture, and yet he was one who actively and openly sought to destroy the message of Christ. This is Paul trying to destroy it, and yet he would not only become a herald of the message, but he would carry it outside of his own people to the lowly Gentile, the one man that wanted nothing to do with Jesus, the most vehement voice against it and then he has an epiphany he sees the risen lord and he says i was wrong and i'm going to do something about this and he did everything that he was called to do and more he was just unbelievable this was his calling and this is the mystery that he was selected to reveal as in colossians 1 26 so let me read that to you and yeah that was good burke none n-u-n I just, that was the funniest comment here. I, I just, I I've never read anything like that in my life. And what are, you know, and then the thing about his marriage night, that was just crazy. Horrific. But, yeah, yeah, horrific. But, you know, I mean, there are different cultures in the world that do things like that. So, uh, 126, the mystery of which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we had all these, yes, here she is again. Um, we had all these things going against us, and then God says, we're going to get it out now. It's time. The fullness of the time has come, and the Gentiles will receive the message of hope and reconciliation. The message was preached. It was received with gladness. And it eventually was carried by the Gentile throughout all of the world. The deepest analysis of the word, the greatest zeal for missions, the highest desire for the glory of God, all of this for 2,000 years has been carried on by those Paul first was called to minister to. Surely the mystery of godliness is great. Right? Uh, as I said, we have the uh, especially the Germans, and then the British, and then the Americans were the ones to really carry, sons of Japheth, they were the ones to carry the message exactly as Noah prophesied in Genesis chapter 9. That, do you know what I'm talking, she looks like she doesn't know what I'm talking about. I've only done this in this class like 800 times, but she slept through the first 799. Um, let's see here, um, uh, Genesis chapter 9, it says here, okay, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may, Canaan, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. That's a prophecy that the Gentiles, especially the sons of Japheth, would be the ones to carry the message of the gospel. You do remember that now. So Genesis chapter, what's that? She does. She, she was just having a, a, a short, temporary, not getting it. But uh, just in case somebody doesn't know what I'm talking about, Shem is the son from which Israel is descended. They carried the ball all the way from the time of Genesis because Moses received Genesis. So we're putting that under there. Genesis all the way through until the book of John. Okay, that's all Shem. Okay, and then from the book of Acts all the way through to the book of Philemon, which comprises the entire church age, and actually Acts, you can break it in half, 1 through 12 and 13 through 28. Okay, and so we'll even give the first half of Acts to Shem because that is Peter's ministry. And then from 13 through 28, that becomes Paul's ministry. And so you've got the separation between the two. Paul is to the Gentiles, his epistles, and at Philippians, everything from Acts 13 until Philippians, I'm sorry, Philemon, thank you, is all of that is Gentile-led doctrine, Gentile-led epistles, and then from there it will go to the book of Hebrews, which is the end times Jews all the way through, and we've got these little variances, the book of John, 
was a uh, it went both ways. It's a blending of Jew and Gentile. And then what happens is we get John again, his epistles, a blending of Jew and Gentiles. And then we get a final warning of Jude for the whole earth. And then what happens? Revelation. And then even Revelation is broken down into the same structure because it starts with address to the church and then it goes to the uh, four, Revelation 4, 2 to 19, 10 is all about the tribulation period centered on Israel, and then Jesus returns, and it goes on from there. So the structure of the Bible is very clearly laid out in uh, the prophecy of Noah to his sons, okay? Dispensations. It's dispensations, absolutely. It's all right there. there. It's all right yeah. in there. So uh, Paul is the one that carries this. Even though he was a Jew, it is a message to the Gentile. He is the apostle to the Gentiles, which it says explicitly, I think, three times in the New Testament. And Peter is the apostle to the circumcision, it says. And so it's very clear what's going on once you see it. All right. So um, life application. There is a strong push in the modern church to return to all things Jewish. Although understanding the Bible from its original perspective is important, and I don't dismiss this, I translated the first 16 verses of um, uh, Judges 19 over the past four or five days, and uh, it, that's important. I'm getting a Jewish perspective, I'm getting the Hebrew, I'm getting the cultural things, the nuances right from the uh, text, and you need to know those things. There's nothing wrong with that, and there's everything right with it. Okay, I'll finish up the uh, final, let's see here, there's 30 minus 16 is, uh, what it'd be, I guess that would be 14 more uh, verses. It'll take me the rest of the week, but I don't start that for another week. I'm trying to get in advance in case I get sick or something. But um, uh, let's see here, although understanding the Bible from its original perspective is important, it is highly damaging to reject the theology which has been developed by the Gentiles during the Gentile-led church because we're the ones that have found out all of the connections between the Old and New Testament, all of them. I was, uh, as I was translating today and I was thinking about what I was doing, I was thinking there really is no way, there's no way to understand the Old Testament properly without the New Testament. It's just not possible. You can understand what's being said. Yeah, girls being sacrificed and, you know, all these things. But you do not understand what is going on, why it is going on, and all of the prophecies that say that something is coming can't be understood unless you know what the New Testament says. And vice versa. It, it, yeah, no way. It's impossible. Well, vice versa, New Testament you can understand. You just can't get the you depth of knowledge. You can't, you yeah. can't, you know, but two poles. Oh, absolutely. That, you you, you <laughs> need doesn't... to have both to get a full comprehension of what's going on. It's just not right to stay in the New Testament and say, I don't need the Old Testament. It's unbalanced. And as he said, there's two poles on the ark. The poles picture the two testaments of the Bible. And there, the ark is carried by them. Okay. If you take out one pole, you're carrying an ark that's swinging like this. You're not getting dragging what you need to have. Yeah, you may be dragging it. So uh, it's just... It's important to know that you cannot fully appreciate or comprehend in any way, shape, or form what is going on in the new without the old. The new you can comprehend and you can get it. You just can't have the depth of knowledge. And so you need to have both. So um, although understanding the Bible from its original perspective is important, it is highly damaging to reject the theology which has been developed through Gentile efforts. This is especially so when reinserting the now fulfilled and obsolete law of Moses into our life. If we do that, we are only crucifying ourselves. That's all we're doing. As a matter of fact, the author of Hebrews uses that terminology, basically. You're trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. You're re-crucifying him, not ourselves, but him. Anyway, um, it's... Uh, it is setting aside the grace of Christ, which is exactly what Paul warned against all the way throughout his ministry. All the way. Every epistle deals with it. Galatians absolutely is almost entirely dealing with it. Let us be sound in our theology and hold fast to the principal tenets of the faith without getting caught up in the idol worship of all things Jewish. And I'm not one to reject the Jewish things. I'm one to speak about them. I'm one to teach them the feasts of the Lord, and everything else, they all have relevance, but they are not an end in and of itself. 
Jesus Christ is the end of all understanding of the Bible. And you cannot understand all things Jewish without Jesus, and you cannot understand Jesus without understanding what is penned to, by the New uh, Testament epistles. Paul is a Jew, but he wrote to the Gentiles, and then the study that has been done by the Gentiles in uh, relation to Paul's writings and how they bear on the Old Testament. Okay, you can't do it. It's just not possible. So don't get caught up in this idol worship like people with the King James only. That's idol worship. They no longer are worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping a version of the Bible. And not even okay. the original. Not even, not even close to the original. <laughs> you know, one thing I do, and I don't know if I said this or not, I may have, but what I do every single time, every single time that I translate a verse into Hebrew. I then take it and I have a document that's errors in the King James Version. And I put it side by side and I see how many errors are in the King James Version of that translation. It is an exception. Not It is an exception to not have an error in any given verse. One verse will have anywhere from one to 10 or 12 errors in it from the King James. And I'm not talking about the tense of verbs. I never check that. If it says, if it's a perfect tense verb, if I checked it, there'd be 20 of them in every verse. Perfect tense verb means that it's done and you have to say something like finished. Well, they might say finishing. You know, it, it's, they don't make it a, uh, I'm sorry, perfect verb. I think I said present tense. Anyway, perfect verb means that something is over. Then they'll have it as if it's ongoing. I don't check those things because, you know, that's just, whatever. I'd be doing it all day. But they leave out words. They insert words that they do not italicize. They One of the biggest things they do is they fail to take singulars and make them plural if the original is plural or vice versa. If the, the original is singular, they'll make it a plural. And here's an example from one I just translated is the tribe of the Danite, it says, or the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. And what do they do? They say, Benjamites. They make it plural. And that's not right. It's wrong. And you cannot understand what is being said properly for typology if it is a plural and they make it a singular or vice versa. There is a reason why God will switch right in the middle of a passage and say, the Danite, and then he'll say, Danites. Okay. He does that for a reason. That's important stuff. And they don't do that. And so each one of those will be an error. They leave out the word when it's not to be there goes on and on and on with it. So as far as that, I've got a list that now is hundreds and hundreds of pages long of errors in the King James Version. And yet people adamantly avow that it's the only... I, it's authorized. Maddening. maddening. What? It's authorized. Uh, yeah, it's authorized. Yeah, it is. Um, anyway, uh, next one is um, uh, we just read preached on uh, the Gentiles. And so the next one is, let's see here, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. So we're continuing on. The fact that Christianity is believed at all is almost incomprehensible. A man believed to be God is said to have entered the stream of humanity, been born of a virgin, never held any high position, was supported by women as he taught in a society where that would be almost unconscionable, stayed within a very confined geographic area, was eventually rejected by his own people, and was then nailed to a cross where he died. And then he came back to life. Who would believe that? I mean, think of it. Who would even believe that unless they understood the nature of man and the necessity for that exact event. Who would believe it? Okay. The entire account seems almost too incredible to imagine. And yet it is exactly this message which is understood to be the only cure of the fallen human condition. You can talk to somebody about Jesus and you can tell them what he did. And for some reason, humans get it. Not all of them. A lot of them just say, I, you know, or they, they don't want to acknowledge their sin or they don't want to change from their sin or whatever their excuse is. But you can give that message to a little child and that little child will get it. You can give it to a doctor, somebody that's been trained for eight or 10 years in a, a medical facility or what do you call it? University. He's been working for the next 10 years. He's a very smart individual. He goes to internships all the time to keep his doctor stuff up. 
and you tell him the message and he gets it on a completely different level than that little child. You can tell it to a plumber while he's working and the plumber will break down in tears while he's working. I've seen that. People get the message of Jesus and it seems to be completely non-gettable. And yet you talk to people and they understand without any extra addition or any nonsense thrown in there, that guy died for me. They get it. That's what's incredible about the message of Jesus. Anyway, uh, the message of Christ has been believed on in the world, Paul's words, because it makes sense. Humanity understands its disconnect from God. It understands the concept of sin. It understands the idea of substitution, atonement, and justification. People get this. A little child, you might need to explain what justification is, but when you tell her, she'll get it. When you tell her little brother what, uh, uh, what's the other one, substitution is, he gets it, right? This person took what you deserve for you. Dad, I didn't mean to do it. And the big brother says, Dad, will you give me the spanking instead? They understand that. They get that. And the big brother takes the spanking for his little brother. And it's satisfied. And Dad doesn't give his little baby brother a, a spanking because of it. Okay? That may not be fair, but that's people get that. Okay? Or you're in a, a courtroom and somebody has violated the speed limit and he's got a $250 fine and he can't afford it. And the lawyer says, you know what? If that's all it is, I'll pay it. Right? People, I don't think a lawyer would do that. Well, maybe one or two. But anyway, uh, the, the, the fine is satisfied. That's it. They know that it's been paid. And so nobody cares where the money comes from. All they care about is that there is a debt and it has to be paid. Okay? People get these doctrines. They may need a little explanation, but they will get these doctrines. You know what? I emailed Rick and Steve before class today, and I told them to be here on time, and neither one of them is here. Well, you know, the bus from Indianapolis is... Well, that's true. It was way, but I told them that the, there's no rain here now, and they should have been able to make it. So, anyway, okay. Um, let's see here. Um, these things don't take a rocket science scientist to understand. They don't, okay? They may take a little explanation, because we use big words to describe things, but if you just explain what the word means... People get it, okay? They, they at, at, absolutely get it. Anyway, they also don't take a certain culture to grasp. This is another thing. Man, I've talked, you've talked to people all over the world. You probably have too. Uh, you've gone on mission trips. Do, is it more establishing things when you go or is it actually going out in the field when you two go together? It's been more just ministry. Establishing the people in the ministry, okay. But uh, if you're out there and you're talking to people, I have talked to people from all kinds of cultures, okay? And they get it. I've talked to people from Laos and from Thailand and from here and from there, and they get it, okay? It doesn't matter where you're from, people understand the need for Jesus. Once you tell them what sin is, and, you know, I talked to some Thai people one day and I said sin, and they, they didn't know that English word. And it took a little while for me to explain it, and then they blah, 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 and they they knew exactly they have a word for it in Thailand, but it's not sin, and they just don't talk about it here in America because there's no need. But they have a word for it, and then I started telling them about sin and what happens. Oh, they'd never thought the process through, but once you introduce what it is and you tell them about substitution and justification and atonement, they get it, and they say, "Gee, I need Jesus." It works. Whoever you talk to, eventually the words will get through to them and they will understand. If there's enough of a language uh, capability between the two of them, they will get it. I remember the day that Jesus, uh, uh, Hideko met Jesus. We were sitting in a uh, office. We went to the school, which is adjoined to a church. And the uh, pastor was also the, what do you call it, the principal. Yeah, and so uh, we're going in there to have our annual thing for the children. And the pastor happens to walk by and he says, oh, you're the Garrett's, aren't you? Oh, yeah. And he says, well, do you know Jesus? And I said, yeah, I know Jesus. And he was like a shark, man. He, he would attack. And so he knows Jesus. I'm done with him. So he goes to Hedico. Do you know Jesus? And she, her exact words, has not hit me like husband. And so he said, well, let me tell you about Jesus. And like three minutes later, she's receiving Jesus. I mean, that's all it took. It didn't take very long. And, you know, that's I'd never evangelized anybody. I'd probably read the Bible 45 times by the time we met that guy. And 
but I'd never taken the time to turn it around. And until you start teaching, you can't undo what you've got inside of you. It's all packaged up. And so you need to just start teaching or you need to start talking and it all comes out. But that's how you process things. But when he did that, I learned immediately how to evangelize. And then from there, I couldn't shut up telling people about Jesus. You know, before that, I just wanted to learn about Jesus. I went to read and read and read and read about Jesus. And then when I learned that you can tell people about Jesus and it's so simple, that's all I wanted to do after that. Go down to the beach and with a chair and come sit down here and let's talk about Jesus. I had a little sign that said, come here and let's talk about Jesus. And it, 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 people get it from every culture on the planet. Okay. So um, they also don't take a search, certain culture to grasp the child barely old enough to leave mommy's watchful presence for a few minutes will get the simple gospel. The lost soul in Asia, the Americas, in Europe, or in Africa, or even in the remotest island in the ocean, all hear the message and respond. All over the world, people have responded to this message. It doesn't mean everybody has, but the, the people that hear it, and they are they're tuned into the things of their life, and understanding their life is short and it's going to end, will get the message, and they will accept it. It's just unbelievable. Different cultures, different languages, and traditions all seem to have hints tucked away in them. Cultures have little hints about it. We've talked about the, the uh, kanji, the Chinese characters. They're actually hints of the gospel in the Chinese character, the alphabet of the Chinese language, that they didn't know were there. It took a missionary who had to learn the Chinese language in order to find these because they're not thinking that way. They just take it, you know, I write, uh, you know, I'm going to the store, I-A-M-G-O, and I'm not thinking about I has a meaning, A-M has a meaning, each one of these things has a meaning somewhere in our history. It was all brought together. We don't think about that. We just write, I'm going to the store, and we put the note on the fridge and go out. The Chinese alphabet has codes in it of the gospel, of the fall of man, of the flood of Noah. It's all right there. And I know this. I know this personally, because I've got a wife that reads those characters. Then somebody was showing on TV all of these characters. I'm like, that's incredible. And so I went and I printed off these characters. Then I said to her, is that correct? And she said, absolutely. And then she said, that one's a little sketchy there. Okay, they may have stretched that one. But some of them are so, isn't it true? They're so obvious, it's right there. Here's a garden. Here's two people in it. You know, they have this sin, the introduction of sin, the devil. They're all in these Chinese characters. And cultures all over the world have flood stories. They have stories of the fall of man. It's It's been twisted. It's been, you know, almost obscured. But they know these things. Intuitively, because of their culture, they know these things. And if you are just willing to, to spend the time with them, they will get it. There's, there's just a universal understanding of this message in people. Uh, the lady's name, by the way, in case you want to look that up, is Edith Kang, okay? She went to China. She learned the Chinese alphabet. She's writing it out. And, you know, like when I do Hebrew, I have to go really slowly, and so it takes me time. And so I can think about each word as I'm translating it. And I'm thinking about how does this fit into this verse, and how does it fit into the passage? And then there's little things about various words that are unusual. This is adjusted. This is cohortative. There's a reason why God used that instead of just a regular verb, okay? And so I can think about those. The Hebrew people aren't thinking about those type of things. And so while I'm translating, I'm thinking about it. And then while I'm doing the analysis for the sermon, I'm thinking about it. And things are in there that we need to know. Well, that's what she did. She said, you know, this is odd. This is a picture of a boat, and there's eight people on it, and that's the story of Noah. It's all right there. So go look it up online. You can see it. And then since she did this years ago, and she published a book or somebody published it for her or whatever, Chinese people have started to study their own language. And there are people that speak very good English that do sermons on their language. And they tell you all the things they find in their language that points to what she first found. Okay, all kinds of stuff, way beyond what she did. She just took, you know, these stories that she knew, and there they are. But you can go and you can find that stuff, watch these videos on YouTube and so forth, or you can go to sites that have Edith Kang's work on it, and, and uh, it, it's very interesting. But this is all over the world. People have these things. They have it tucked away in them, which point directly to what God has done in Christ. 
being realized after the message is revealed. Yes. K-A-N-G, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's Edith Kang, K-A-N-G. If I didn't get it right, Google will pick it up for you, you know, but I'm pretty sure that's how it is. And I got them right down here. I can show you. I've got them in a book right down under the uh, pulpit there. And uh, we can pull them out and I can show you some of them. It's, it's great. As a matter of fact, if you want to grab that book, maybe I can find them really quickly. Um, uh, so um, where were we? Um, different cultures. I said that it is as if God has, it's right on the floor under the uh, pulpit. Uh, God has woven the tapestry of humanity together so that when the message is heard, people say, I get this. I need this. The message is truly believed on in the world. And the message is believed on by those who have offended God in a very small way, as well as those who have done so with the greatest of offenses. In fact, it is often the case that the greatest offender becomes the most ardent believer. It's just what, you know, what, what did Jesus say when the lady was wiping uh, his feet with her hair? And uh, uh, he said, you know, you didn't give me water for my feet. And you didn't, you know, and it, this lady, she's had all these offenses wiped away, she'll love more. Well, the people who have the greater offenses are the people that understand the grace. I get this. Whereas if somebody doesn't think he's a bad guy, it doesn't mean as much to him. Yeah, that's it. it? Yeah, we'll see if we can find it in there while we're looking. We'll just give this one second and we'll see if we can find them in here. Uh, Oh, here's some right here. Okay, these are Chinese characters. I don't know if you can see them, but this is a boat. It has vessel, eight people, okay? This one is to covet or desire. Two trees, tree of knowledge of good and evil, tree of uh, life, women to covet desire, okay? She's verified these. To create, speak, dust, life, walk, mud. It's just like a man's being created, right? Uh, Complete or finish. Two, the number two, uh, right here. Person, right here. And then first, first home complete, okay? Uh, What do we got here? Um, forbidden to warn two trees and God right there garden dust breath to enclosure garden persons all written into that one little thing Edith Kang finds these let me see did I get her name right uh uh oh I'm sorry it's C.H. Kang and Ethel Nelson I got I that was I I I combined C.H. Kang and Ethel Nelson okay tempter devil a uh, secret man, garden, alive, devil. And then devil is devil, trees, cover, tempter. Okay, so you've got uh, all these. I, I, anyway, I might be reading it wrong, but that's a very, very deep thing. But it's got all that information right in there. Anyway, so those are just some of the things that you'll find in the Chinese language. And as I said, after that, people have taken the Chinese language, the Chinese that live there, and they've said, wow, our language has more in it than we realized. And they've been analyzing it. And they find all these wonderful things in there that are that are just amazing. Anyway, so um, uh, I hope I gave the name again. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but I'm going to um, look at it again anyhow. Yeah, please do. There's all kinds of great stuff. i got piles of stuff in that book. I haven't been in there in years. Anyway, um, let's see here. So uh, this message, what did I say? The simple message of grace through faith in the finished work of Christ is a message that heals the human soul. It repairs the infinite rift, and it brings gladness to both sinner and angel. It is the message of God which is found in the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, for the sin of the world. And this message is believed on in the world. Life application. The wisdom of God is revealed in the belief by humanity in the gospel. Surely, the mystery of godliness is great. Wonderful stuff. Just marvelous what God has done for us and the fact that it's been believed on. And the best part of it is it's not over for Israel. It's so wonderful to think that they will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus someday. God has not rejected them. It's maddening to think that people just ignore that and they say oh they're out there you know the whole world you know what the whole world right now is fighting against a little sliver of land in the middle of what a hundred years ago was absolutely nowhere's bill that nobody wanted to be there nobody wanted to pass through there it was nowhere's bill and a bunch of people that had wanted to go back there for two thousand years every year what was it they said at the uh, passover 
next, next year. year in Jerusalem. And finally it happened. And you want to know why? You want to know how it happened? Christians. Christians. The modern Zionist movement. Christians said dispensationalism suddenly became understood by uh, you know, John Darby. Now, people will say, well, John Darby made up, and I think I referred to this in the book of Matthew introduction, but they say John Darby made up the uh, doctrine of, and it's a new teaching. Well, that is a, a fallacy of thinking. Just because something is new doesn't mean it's incorrect. And it's also double fallacy because the people that say this are replacement theologians, and most of them are Calvinists. And the Calvinists only came a couple hundred years earlier, not even that, 150 years earlier. Out of the whole church age, that's like from walking from here to there, right? It's nothing. So they're trying to defend Calvinism while they're dismissing dispensationalism. And it's not true that John Darby invented dispensationalism. He didn't. Paul did. Well, actually, God did. Oh. Paul is the one that wrote about it. Didn't but you just read about it? In, uh, we just read about it in Isaiah. Right. But the, one that, the guy that defined it is Paul. It's defined right there. It's black and white, okay? And so Jesus... Or the Lord God is the one that established dispensationalism. And it is clearly revealed in the typology. We've seen that again and again since um, probably the first time that I realized dispensationalism was in Scripture was in Genesis 28 through 32. It's right there. Jacob's entire time, from the time he leaves his father, he goes up to Padam Aram, he comes back, he stops here, he stops here, he goes to Sukkot, Dispensate, all the dispensations are right there in his travels, okay? And then what does he do? Uh, Esau's coming out to meet him with 400 people, right? And so uh, uh, Jacob starts sending him gifts. And those are the dispensations. This is the reconciliation of God with man. Esau is a picture of fallen Adam, right? Esau made man, Asa, or Edom, which is Adam. He's a picture of the made man who is Adam. And Jacob is sending him these gifts to appease him, to bring him to reconciliation with himself. It's a picture of Christ sending us the dispensations. And then we see the dispensations absolutely perfectly displayed beautifully in the book of Esther. Absolutely perfectly beautifully displayed in the book of Esther. She's, uh, what's her name is, uh, Vashti is told to come out in front of all the people and she's not wearing anything, right? He says, bring her out here, and you can get it from the Hebrew that she is coming out. She's in innocence, right? And then there's the fall. There's all of these things going on. They are perfectly described in the book of Esther. So yes, God has it in the Old Testament, but it was hidden. Paul opens it up for us, okay? So all God is a dispensationalist. Jesus is a dispensationalist, who is God, by the way. And then Paul is a dispensationalist. So John Darby isn't the one that thought it up. He's just the one that discovered it. Okay, and he he and other people. It's probably not only Darby, but you know he gets the, the uh, he gets yeah flaming he, arrows yeah he gets the flaming that. arrows for being you know what and what did they do? He yeah, well he no, explained it. But here's something that they do with people like John Darby and with Schofield. They tear the person apart sure. in order to destroy the doctrine. Oh, he was this, and he listen. Go look in the mirror, buddy. Whoever you are, you're no better. Okay, but that's what they do. It, it, that's all fallacies of thinking. Everything they do is a fallacy of thinking. Don't get me wrong, dispensationalists will do that too. We want to attack the source rather than the information. Okay, and so that's how humans are, are geared. But um, uh, anyway, mystery of godliness believed on in the world. And the next one is the mystery of godliness. I had something I was going to say and I forgot. Uh, so, to close out the mystery of godliness, um, I better read it. It was uh, the last one. I, oh, that's what it was. I was going to read it. Received up in glory. Okay, we just had believed on in the world. Received up in glory. What's that? I guess I could look at Strong's to see believe. How many times believe is written in the Bible? Uh, it will tell you in Strong's. I don't know personally. Yeah, but You don't know. No, but I'm going to tell you. Believed is a word that is very important to blow away the doctrine of Calvinism, which says that we're regenerated in yeah. order to believe. It never teaches that. That's not anywhere in Scripture. And what I could do is attack Calvin personally. You could. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> To close out the mystery of godliness, which he has been describing, Paul now speaks of Christ's final act of his earthly ministry. He was received up in glory. The actual record of this is found where? Acts 
Acts chapter 1. Can you give the verses? It's, uh, I would say 9 or 10. Okay, uh, we'll read it right now, just because I know 7 and 8 is him telling them to uh, uh, just wait in Jerusalem and to stop asking questions about things that are in the Father's providence. But um, let's see here. What's that? Yeah, that's that's right. It's got to be 9, right in that area. Okay, Acts, and then we've got... Um, uh, let's see here. And, and it's so funny. You know what? They ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom? It, it, people read this. How many people, scholars, read this book? They've read this how many times in their life? And they don't get it. It's right there. It says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's right there. Those people know that there was a kingdom coming to Israel. They knew it. This isn't something that was suddenly pulled out by John Darby. These people were waiting for a kingdom. It's right there. And they read it and they think, oh, well, that never happened. And so God's doing something new. Jesus never says that. Instead of directly answering the question, he goes on. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put under his own authority. It's right there. He didn't say there's not going to be a kingdom. He says, it's not for you to know when. Meaning, you will not know when. No, meaning that there will be a kingdom. Oh, yes. You don't know when, but there will be a kingdom for Israel. Okay? And people just read right over that like it doesn't say what it says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So it, it's right there right there, that there will be a kingdom. The Jews expected it. They understood the Bible. They had just been with Jesus for 40 days while they're talking about these issues. And the last thing they want to know is Jesus is telling them all these things are coming. There's no doubt he said that because that's the word that they had. They didn't have the New Testament. And so they're all wondering, well, if this is coming, when is it coming? And so they curiously ask, and he doesn't say it's not coming. In fact, he implies it is coming you just are not going to know when okay. yeah exactly <laughs> now when he had spoken these things while they watched verse 9 he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight so it is it's acts 1 verse 9 oh what did i have in my commentary to read okay <laughs> Duh. all right so uh we'll go on and we'll read a little more of that because i said actually acts 1 9 through 11 so let me just read the whole thing and I don't know why I put the whole thing, but we're going to read it. Okay, so uh, taken out of their sight, and when they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, oh yeah, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, <laughs> men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So here they are, they're expecting a kingdom. Now they're told that they have to go out and evangelize. So what do they do? They go out and evangelize. They go do exactly what he's told them to do. And they start in Jerusalem. They go to Jumeria, uh, Judea and then Samaria. And then Paul gets the word and off to the ends of the earth. Okay, so there you go. Believed on in glory, received up. Uh, believed on uh, in the world, received up in glory. There it records, just after his final words to the disciples, that momentous event, Acts 1, 9 through 11. Being received up in glory means this was an actual event for us to contemplate. And it is not just a minor add-on by Paul. Instead, it is to show that this man, Jesus Christ, fully human, had prevailed in his earthly ministry. The ascension confirms what the resurrection speaks of. He was crucified and he was raised. And to further demonstrate God's approval, he was not only raised, but he was taken up in glory. The man, Jesus, is the one who was accepted because of the perfection of his life and work. As a sign of that acceptance, he was taken up directly to heaven where he will remain until the appointed time for his return. It says, Jesus is now where? In the right hand of the Father. What does that mean? Is there power. It, it means all the power and authority. The right hand is the position of power and authority. 
that belongs to Jesus. It doesn't mean that he's sitting on the right, the God's right hand. Okay, God is spirit. God does not have parts. Okay, God is spirit, and Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God. He is the one that now possesses all of the authority and all of the power of God. All of it, not some of it, not as a conduit for God. He is God. He possesses all of what God possesses. He prevailed. He is the God-man. Okay, so um, the ascension confirms what the resurrection speaks of. Uh, let's see here. He was taken directly to heaven where he will remain until the appointed time for his return. Until then, he sits at the right hand of the Father with all power and authority at his command. The record of the ascension is a vital part of the ministry of godliness because in that record is also included the record of his promised return. I can't wait. I know you can't wait. We were talking about that before class today. Mark here is all excited about Jesus' return. And, you know, uh, we were talking about something is that we've got a... Uh, uh, Cuban sub. Everybody's Russian, all bent out. Of, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Russian sub in Cuba. Everybody's all bent out of shape over it and all this stuff going on down there. And uh, we were talking about where, if there's a nuclear war, things are going to get exploded. And they're gonna, it's going to be, you know, we know the Pentagon is going to be like the first thing to go. Well, guess what? CENTCOM, which is right down the road, is going to be blown up. There will be no more McDill Air Force Base. That is a strategic target, okay? That is going to go. Now, if the nuke misses by about 35 or 40 miles, I told somebody out in Washington, I told my friend that I hope it just lands on my house. So I just, I'm evaporated. And it doesn't concern me. It doesn't worry me. I'm not, I could not care. It's not like I'm going to sit and bite my fingernails that we've got Russians in Cuba right now. It doesn't matter. And I hope everybody here has the same attitude. Whatever happens in this life, whether you get cancer or whether you, you know, get your legs cut off in a car accident, or it's just life. It's just it, it, bad things happen to people all the time. We are not going to be exempt. And I'm not going to spend my life worrying about stuff that could happen. If it happens, it happens. And in the meantime, we got something to do, right? So um, do you remember this? I was talking to these two before everybody else came in. And I want to know if you remember this the Russian sub that was trapped inside the uh, Tampa uh, Sunshine Skyway Bridge back in the 1970s. Do you remember that? I know exactly where it is. And, you know, I don't have that memory. It's, it's she remembers it, but she's not remembering. Here's what happened. When we were young, this would have been in the late 70s, yeah. no later than this. News Channel 8 had a, uh, a, a broadcast and they showed helicopters flying around. They showed warships going in the sea. And they said they've trapped a Russian sub in Tampa Bay. It can't get out because you got the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. And so they're showing these boats going by and they're showing people with their, their stuff on and the boats and they're, they've got this thing trapped. And then at the end of the broadcast, they said, April Fools. It was the first of April. And everybody that saw that was, comp do you remember that now? No, but there is, a, there, I don't, I don't relate the story, but there is a, on the uh, Skyway Bridge, on the... Oh, yeah, yeah, there, there was, that's right, there was a sign about an actual submarine that went down, but that's probably where they got the idea from yeah. it. And it was April 1st of like 1978 or something. Mm -hmm. And they went in and they did. They had a great day. They had all this footage from probably from old war movies or something. And they're showing all this going on. April Fool's. Well, I don't care if that happens. Yeah. It just doesn't bother me. Yeah. It, it, that, that doesn't excite me at all. Yeah. What excites me is Jesus is coming. If I'm in the grave or if I'm alive, Jesus is coming. All this stuff is just stuff in the meantime. Yeah, there's a memorial. Oh, right there. Right there. I, and that's probably where they got that idea from yeah. because there was a shipwreck of a submarine. I don't know if it was Russian, but something. And they probably said, this is a great idea. And they got everybody. <laughs> everybody that watched that was just flipped out. Anyway, um, okay, so um, let's see here. Uh, he sits at the right hand of the Father. Okay. Um, what says, uh, until that time, oh, he is not simply ascended and will bring himself. Okay. Until then he sits at the right hand of the father with all, where am I? Yes. All power and authority at his command. 
the record of the ascension is a vital part of the ministry, okay? And it is not that he simply ascended, will bring himself to us as we die, but that there is a true and literal return expected as well. It's not just that we're going to go up to him someday. It is that he is literally going to come back to the earth. It is a time when the blessings of the messianic kingdom will be realized on earth. Until that time, we have the sure and complete promise that he now sits at the right hand of God. Everything that happens in this world is within his control. He's allowing the wickedness in the world because humans are allowed to do what they want to do. They messed it up completely in the year 1656 after the creation and the world was destroyed. Okay, he entered into the stream of humanity and after that, there was this time of the development of the gospel throughout the world and eventually that message is starting to be rejected by most of the world because humans are corrupt. Okay, and there's going to be a where he's going to say, it is no longer effective for my people to be on this earth. It's counterproductive. And so that is when he's going to take us home. He knows when that's going to happen. Until that day, we're just waiting on it to happen. And then when we're gone, he is going to allow mankind to just do what it wants. And it's going to completely destroy itself. Just like he did with the flood, man is going to do it to himself. The world is going to be destroyed by fire because we cannot honor God. We just cannot do it. You know, I get so, I won't say it. I don't want to get into politics right now, but I get so mad seeing what's going on in this world. And it's just a precursor to what's coming. It's just a precursor right now. When the church is out of here, it's going to be hands off wickedness. Okay. So um, uh, life application. Are you or someone you know facing your own mortality? Is death's hand close to you? If you or your loved one are in Christ, death is not the end of your story. The mystery of godliness, which speaks of Jesus Christ, also speaks of you. If you are in Christ, you are under the safe care of the ruler of the universe. So why would you be concerned? Every promise he has made has a 100% guarantee of being fulfilled. Rest easy in the surety that all is well with your soul. I 100%, I, I just, I don't mean to sound perverse when I say if I get blown up, but I don't care. I really don't care. You know, the, the garage flooded and Hedico knows I was excited about that. And then I said, what am I mad about? We've been praying for rain for weeks, right. <laughs> for, for months, no, for a year and a half now. And I just said, I'm not going to let this get me down. And the roof started leaking, and we get out a bucket. And then it's dripping down the thing and get out another bucket. By the time we'd done, we got four buckets out there. We got towels all over the place. And I sat there happy because I'm not going to let it worry me. You know, you get excited about things, and then you think about it. It's not that important. It's just not that big of a deal, right? The roof will get fixed, or it'll get replaced. And, you know, I said to a couple people, I hope this is the last roof I ever have to replace. I've replaced a lot of roofs in my life, and I don't ever want to do another one, so I hope this is the last time. But whatever. Life application. I already read that. 4-1. 4-1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Hmm. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Oh, we didn't do the chapter 3 recap. We've got to do that for the next couple of weeks. We'll finish that and then come back to chapter 4. I'm kidding. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, 4-1. The words of chapter 4 now show a contrast to the ending thoughts of chapter 3. Paul's making a logical <laughs> separation between the two. Here's the glory of Christ. Here's what's coming in the end times. Okay, so um, Paul has been writing of the high standards and qualifications for men entering into the ministry, focusing on their faith and on their faithfulness. He then wrote about the mystery of godliness. In contrast to that, he says, now the Spirit expressly says. You can see what he's doing. He's making that thing that he said about Jesus in 3.16, he's making it an anchor that goes this way in the epistle. 
it's right in the middle of it, and then it branches out in opposite directions. And you'll do this in 2 Timothy as well. So, um, uh, where is it? Um, uh, in contrast to that, he says the Spirit expressly says the word but rather than now is used by some translations to show this stark contrast. Uh, you know, it's just like in English or Hebrew, you have a word and it can have different meanings. And so the word whatever, I don't know which word it was, they will say, it can mean but or then or also or whatever. And uh, so it just translators choose what they think is best. But is probably the best here because it's the contrast. Okay, anyway, um, the mystery of godliness has been revealed and it is a revelation which should direct the hearts and souls of men at all times. The focus of the believer should be on Christ. Jesus, that's what we should be doing. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, right? Okay. Um, so uh, the mystery of godliness has been revealed, but we should direct our hearts and souls to him at all times. The focus of the believer should be on Christ and the greatness of what he has done. Instead, there is a contrast which he will now state, which is that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. The term in the latter times, and this is something that it, it, it's kind of maddening to me how people misuse this. It is not some nebulous time which will occur all of a sudden. Okay, that's not what Paul is saying. And which will somehow indicate that the rapture is close at hand or some thought similar to this because this is how 99% of the church uses this term. These words are often used to support such a conclusion. See, the things that Paul wrote about are happening now, and so we must be in the latter times, okay? Rather, the things Paul will describe have been occurring since the Lord departed. In fact, the epistles were written to expressly refute much of what Paul will mention in these coming verses. It may be true, and it is true, that wickedness is filling the world more and more as the end draws near. We know that, okay? But that is not the context of Paul's words now. The truth of this is seen in the words of past scholars, okay? All you need to do is look to the past, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, Charles Ellicott said several centuries ago, so think of Charles Ellicott, right? He's and John Gill and all these people were going back to the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s. Charles Ellicott said, The errors foreseen then have more or less affected the internal government of the church during the 1800 years which have passed since St. Paul's words were written. In no age, perhaps, have they been more ostentatiously thrust forward than in our own. And it's not true. There's been wickedness in the church all along. You look at what some of these so-called popes did, like in the 600s and 700s, the things that they did were just as bad or just maybe worse than what's going on. They'd like dig up other popes and they'd put their bodies on display and they'd yell at them. No kidding. There's like, they just go exhume a pope, one of the previous ones, and they'd have a trial against a dead guy. It's just crazy stuff. This is humanity. We've been doing this kind of stuff all along, okay? There's all kinds of wickedness. So Charles Ellicott says that this is the epitome of the wickedness in the 1800s. Well, that was in the 1800s. Right. We went through the 1900s, and now we're in the 2000s, right? Things continue to get worse, but it's been bad all along. In the latter times, as indicated, he says that some, Paul, will depart from the faith. Departure from the faith has already been noted as an occurrence by Paul in verses 1, 18, and 20. So it was happening at the time of Paul, okay? Hymenaeus and Alexander had shipwrecked their faith. And in his next letter, Demas will be said to have departed from the faith, okay? So uh, Paul says, having loved this present world. That was Demas's thing. He wanted to go back to the world. All right, so that's 2 Timothy 4.10. So what Paul is saying is that this is the latter times. This is the times after Christ has been received up in glory. This is the latter times, okay? They had no idea that the latter times were going to last 2,000 years. Why did they not know this? Because, because G revealed. what? It wasn't revealed that's right, because Jesus told them it is not for you to know. Right. They didn't know if it would be 80 years or 100 years or 3,000 years, or a million years. They had no idea at all how long it would be. 
And so this is the latter times. And as I said, there's been just as much crazy doctrine and wickedness and uh, uh, diabolical acts all the way through the church age. The difference between then and now is that we have a worldwide system of communication. We have TVs. We, you know, when Mount Krakatoa blew, it was in the 1800s, I think. It was so loud that it deafened people hundreds of miles away. And people died by the bucketful. Probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I don't know. Okay. But it was in an isolated part of the world. So they got information about it, but it was just something isolated. However, in the tsunami of uh, Indonesia, what, five years ago? 250,000 people perished? What? No, it was in 2004. 2004. Okay, so it's been a while. It shows you how old and how quickly I'm getting old. But, okay, 2004, 250,000 people perish. And everybody got to see it. And so they're saying, this is the end times. This is judgment of God. It couldn't have been any worse than Krakatoa's explosion. It couldn't be. It's just a different type of thing, right? But now we have, you're hearing all these people constantly on the news say, look at all of the, uh, of the tornadoes in the middle of America now. Look at all the destruction. Those tornadoes have been going on since the beginning. The difference is there are more people living there now, and we now track those things. Whereas before, they just happened, and the things would get blown away, and that was that. But now we have an accumulation of data, and so everybody's saying, well, this is the end times. Probably it is because we have the accumulation of data, and our wickedness is just growing exponentially because of that. But nothing was different 2,000 years ago. It's the same human heart and the same corrupt people. We just have a way of making the whole world corrupt through our actions, right? We can now do things that were not possible in the past. Okay, so um, if you get the context, Paul's latter times are all the way through the church age because they didn't know when the church age would end. They had no idea, okay? So in the latter times, as indicated, some will depart from the faith. Such a departure is to walk away from the faith, or it also includes adding to or subtracting from the faith. All of these are addressed by Paul in his letters. This is n nothing that is solely expected in the extreme end times, but is a constant theme of the age since Christ ascended. All the way through the church age. And we know that because they're writing about it right in their epistles. Gnosticism is coming in. All of these heresies are coming in right during the time that the apostles were alive. But... As I said a couple of weeks ago, it was proper that that would happen so that they could defend against it in their epistles so that that would then be inserted into God's word as scripture. And so we have that for the full church age. And that's what makes it so unconscionable that we have the, the decisions that are being rendered in churches right now. They've got the word of God. They've got it right there. You know, I, I, I will say this probably during an update just because, you know, how many people listen to the Bible study as opposed to the, the prophecy updates. But um, uh, the Episcopal Church this past week, uh, the one, the big cathedral up in New York or Washington, I can't remember which, all gay colors. They had those stupid lights, all the gay colors, illuminating the church, Right. And what do they do? It's posted all over Twitter, and they're bragging about it. They're bragging about sticking it right in God's face. Sodom and Gomorrah, right in God's face. They're bragging about it right on Twitter. Some, some guy that works at this church or a pastor or something. And I'm thinking, this is why we have the end times, is because people see that, and then they say, oh, it's okay, we can do it, we can do it, and pretty soon everybody wants to get on it. But it's unconscionable because we have the Bible that tells us not to act in this way. Okay, but it's right that the word came out. It's right that people held to the word as sacred for, you know, a certain number of people throughout the church age. They had the heart for missions. They had the heart for right doctrine. They had the heart for studying the word. And so we have all of that information, all of that collective body of work to stand as a witness against people like that and people like the Pope that are doing things right now, much less the secular world. We have all of this out there so that nobody has any excuse at all. None. Okay? So, I'm starting to get heated because of this. I just It's, it's maddening. Anyway, um, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, there's a much larger departure is occurring as time goes by. Simply shows that the church itself 
has grown to the point where a large departure is to be expected. You have a small church, you have a small departure. You know, Hymenus and Alexander left, but it's a departure. Now you've got this giant church. You've got churches all over the place, and you've got people all over the place, and people depart. Well, that's to be expected. You just have more people doing the same thing that they've been doing all along. Okay, so even on a national scale, as is the case with many national denominations like the Episcopal Church, which is doing what it's doing in the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church and Southern Baptist, uh, what was it, 61 to minus 100, 39% voted for apostasy from the Bible. 39%. What should happen? This is what should happen in the Southern Baptist Church. It will not happen, but this is what should happen, is the 39% that voted for violating scripture should be voted out of the Southern Baptist Convention. If they did that, they would maintain that as a valid denomination. They're not going to do that, and next year it's going to be 42%. The year after that, it's going to be 48%. And then in five or six years, they're going to be making the same decisions, the same votes, as the Methodist Church is right now. It's not going to take long because they are not going to be willing to give up on all that money and all of that uh, power that they possess. But the right thing to do would be to vote those 31% out. You violated scripture in your vote. You are no longer a member of the Southern Baptist Convention, and it's not going to happen. Mark my words. Okay, Paul then explains that such a departure from the faith involves giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrine of demons, doctrines of demons. The words giving heed to deceiving spirits are set in contrast to giving heed to the Spirit of God. You can do one or the other. The Spirit of God has spoken to us through the writing of Scripture. Therefore, anything which is codified into a church law or book of discipline, which contradicts the Word of God, adds to it, or subtracts from it, is to be considered in this category right here, a doctrine of demons. The words doctrines of demons may include that which concerns demons, or that which is taught by demons. It could therefore include odd things which are inculcated from other religions, such as spiritual reliance on Eastern meditations, the reading of palms for divination, and so forth. And you could say, well, that never happens. Listen, when I was a kid, I mean, this is, uh, what am I, 60? I'll be 60 this year. So when I was a what? kid, yes, when I was a kid, probably 10 or 9, we had every year at the church that we attended, the St. Boniface Church Fair. And we went every year. And we went up north every single year during the summer to Mount Washington, Massachusetts, and they had a church fair. Okay, at both of them, they had palm readers, and the people flocked to them. This is when I was a little kid. The Congregationalist Church up in Massachusetts and the church right at the north end of Siesta Key, right down Apostasy Avenue, both had palm readers. That's something that is not authorized in Scripture. Yeah, she's shaking her head. Oh, yeah, I remember that now. Okay, so the reading of palms for divinations and so forth. It could also refer to the worship of other deities in place of Christ, such as worshiping the Virgin Mary, adoring the saints, and so forth. Paul's words are certainly inclusive of all such things. And the Catholic Church is so corrupt that it actually assimilates other religions into it, like Santeria. You go to some countries and they've got these secondary religions which have been inculcated into the Catholic Church. And so it's not Christian at all. It's just a hybrid mixture of stuff. Okay, anything not ba <laughs> excuse me, anything not based <laughs> on Scripture and an adherence to Jesus Christ would fall into the category of these words. By default, any faith-directed wor worship which is not of Christ is ungodly. It is satanic. The devil and his armies, which is exactly what you were talking about before class earlier, the devil and his armies are working actively to destroy sound doctrine. He is there inserting his own perverse doctrine. The spiritual warfare which is going on in this world is described by Paul in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, yes. The spiritual warfare, um, Paul explains this clearly in Ephesians 2 where he says these words. And you he made alive 
who are dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all, all, once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. He admits, we all, we all were in that position. He further describes the spiritual battle the church faces in Ephesians 6. There he tells how to defend against it and even go forward in battle against it. His thoughts in particular center on the word of God and holding fast to the doctrine which is found there. But the devil and his armies have their own twisted view of what is correct. Paul will give several of these false doctrines which they promote in the words which lie ahead. Understanding these things is an important part of not getting misdirected by the lies of the devil. We've been told, we've been warned, it's all right there, and yet churches just have gone all the way completely away from God. And they're, they are doing the work of Satan for him. He doesn't even have to do it anymore. They are now actively doing the devil's bidding in the churches, actively. Okay, life application, we must hold the scripture alone for our doctrine. If we fail to do this, we can become swayed away from soundness in our faith very easily. Let us be faithful, reliable readers and followers of the word of God in order to not be duped by the things Paul so carefully warns us against. Yes? On the internet, either morning, yesterday, this lady said, Biden is the most godly man ever. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's unbelievable how deceived Here's people that. are. You know what? I was saying to somebody before we started today, I go to the White House Twitter feed during the day sometimes. It is not just inaccurate statements. It is bald face lies. Bald face lies. Just, we have created 18 million jobs, blah, blah. Bald face lies yeah. that, that they just pass it on. It, it, nobody holds them accountable. Nobody. And the things that they, this Pride Month, They've got the rainbow colors all over the White House, all over their Twitter account. It's like going to Sodom and Gomorrah just looking at the White House wow. Twitter account every single day. And their individual accounts, Biden's individual account, Harris's individual account, all of them are just like reading about Sodom and Gomorrah. And I keep wondering, when is the Lord going to judge this nation? When is he going to send the big destruction? Because it's, it can't be far away. You know, Billy Graham said years ago that it can't be far away. Let me tell you what. He didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue how bad it is. Heavenly Father, despite how bad it is, we know that we have an eternal, glorious hope in Jesus. We don't need to worry about these people. It's upsetting and it is maddening, but we don't, don't need to worry about them. They're going to have their little party and then they're going to face the consequences unless they turn to you. And maybe you're going to be gracious enough to give us a national calamity which will actually humble their hearts. And wouldn't that be wonderful to see people actually turning to you? But you're in charge of all things. You know what's going to happen, and whatever it is, we leave it in your capable hands. We know that you will do exactly what is right and perfect. And so we just pray for the day when we stand before you, and we're going to have to face our own judgments, and we understand that. But we know that because of Christ, we will be saved even if through fire. So thank you for that promise. Thank you that we have an eternal hope. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to say goodbye now and then wave to you, okay? No sound, no sound. Let's see here. We're going to go to break, break, break. Thank you.